Hi, I'm Kyle Cohan, the owner of Wingzone. We're proud to be associated with the Pat Dooley Show. Check us out at wingzone.com or come see us downtown on University Avenue. Okay, welcome back to another edition of the Pat Dooley Show. It's episode 10 as the season has just flown along. And look at this, Trish. I'm doing my Nick Saban impression. I don't know if you see ever seen him do a press conference. He's waving back. It's like he's a, it's the end of the third quarter of the, of the Florida football games. We are the boys from Nick Saban. Anyway, uh, Florida, of course, winning against Vanderbilt on Saturday night. It was uh, an interesting game in that it was pretty much the same thing we've seen all year. And uh, Florida gets the win. You, you saw a little edge on Urban when he was asked if it was a ho-hum win. And he kind of uh, blew up a little. Not blew up. For him blowing up. Did I blow up? No, I didn't blow up. But he was talking about how they're 19-0, and and he's not going to take anything away from that. I think everybody's got to realize that's the most important stat there is for the Florida football team. 19-0. and 19-0. and They've won 19 straight games. That's amazing. For somebody who grew up following Florida football in the 60s and 70s and 80s, something like that has never seemed possible. But they've done it. 19 straight games for the Gators, and that's what really matters. And, of course, now heading up to face uh, Steve Spurrier and the, and the uh, sorry, call them the Columbia Gamecocks. Now they're South Carolina Gamecocks. They do live in Columbia. Their season's been about what you would expect it to be every year. Start out great, get ranked, things are going well, and then they start to the slide. And now they're sitting there with two games left uh, against Florida this week and then Clemson in two weeks uh, to try to help their bowl chances. Uh, Spurrier on the conference call this week was saying how he was so excited that they've got this. This is the second week in a row he said this. So excited they've gotten to six wins and so happy to be bowl eligible. And I think that tells you a lot about where he is and where this team is. And I, I keep getting asked the question about Steve and what, what's he going to do. Is he going to leave after this year? Is he going to leave after next year? I really, I'm still of the belief he's going to stick around for a while. He wants to see if he can't get this to be a, 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 not an elite program. South Carolina will never be an elite program. But a program where they can win eight, nine, ten games get to a nicer bowl than what they're, they've experienced. And, you know, with some young players, as he said, uh, he said, I think our big win seasons are still a ways off, a couple years off. Uh, so I think he's going to be around. I don't think there's much question. I know that Mike Bianchi wrote he wants to see Steve retire because he doesn't want South Carolina to have the opportunity to run him out. Uh, and, it's, and he likened it to the Bowden situation. And I understand that sentiment. I mean, I think a lot of us here who still have feelings for Steve, Steve's been a good friend of mine for a long time, don't enjoy what's happening to them. Don't enjoy that now you're getting the chirping going on from the South Carolina fans. Maybe it's time for him to retire. Get rid of his son. Boy, where did I hear that? Seems my, maybe over out west I heard that a uh, couple of years ago with Jeff Bowden. Now it's Steve Spurrier Jr. that fans are getting chippy about. But hopefully he'll get it turned around and get them going. But not this week. I know the Gator Nation's telling him, Dooley, shut up. Don't get, let him turn it around this week. Well, we'll see what happens Saturday. Their team is a good team, not a great team, as you know. Garcia's better, not, still not great. You know, their running game is almost non-existent. Their defense has been good all year until last week when they got lit up by Ryan Mallett. Uh, I think Florida, if, again, Florida's biggest foe is Florida. If they go out there and they take care of business and don't turn the ball over, they're going to win. I, I feel very confident in that. But if they do turn it over and make mistakes, you know, they can lose to anybody. Uh, well, almost anybody. Probably not Vanderbilt. All right, let's go to the uh, three things segment where I'm going to talk about the three things I learned this weekend. Okay, the number one thing I learned this weekend is that Florida is what it is, and that is a team that's not going to be great offensively this year. I've kind of like a lot of you have been waiting for them to explode. Hasn't happened. Uh, we haven't seen the young receivers emerge. We haven't seen a lot of things we thought we were going to see. It just hasn't happened, so it's probably not going to happen. You're nine games in. This is a team that is based on defense, Tebow, and special teams. Excellent special teams again last week. The defense is playing lights out, and they're going to do, do just enough offensively to win. But the one thing you got to look at with this team is whenever they're threatened, whenever the game gets close, they take the ball down the field on a drive and score points and, and make you feel a little bit better. And that's all you need to be. There's no rule that says you have to be a high-scoring team to be the best team in the country. Number two thing I learned this weekend is that bowls aren't a birthright. And I'm speaking specifically to you out there, Bulldog fan, Seminole fan, Sooner fan, and Wolverine fan. These are four of the you know, most uh, successful programs in the country year in, year out. But they're all sitting here going, you know, we might not be bowling. Think about it for Florida State. they got to win two of their last three. They're going to Wake Forest, which has beat them three times in a row, with a backup quarterback who's thrown four passes in his career. 
They could easily lose that game. They still got the Swamp to come to. And then Maryland in between. Maryland's awful, so they should win that one. But that would be something if they go 5-7 and seven and don't go to a bowl. That may be enough to even get the most ardent Bobby Bowden supporter, supporters to go ahead and say, Bobby, it's time. Georgia is in a similar situation, although they're, they're in a better situation. But they got Auburn and Georgia Tech, two really good teams left. They still need another win to get bowl eligible. Oklahoma needs another win. And the way things are going for them, and after that 10-3 loss to Nebraska, nothing would surprise me there. And, of course, uh, Michigan, which looked like the, the up-and-coming, all right, Rich Rod has got it figured out team early in the season, they're in the same situation. They still need some wins to get in to a bowl. So, there, you know, we may be ended up having a bowl season with a lot of games you don't really want to watch, with a lot of teams you don't really care about. Uh, so I'm kind of rooting for all these guys to get in so you get a reason to watch. And the number three thing that I learned this weekend is that Charlie Weiss is in trouble. And I think everybody knows that and everybody's talking about it. But interesting stat that, that a lot of national guys are, are bringing up, and it's a great point. If he loses this game this week, and that's very possible, at Pitt, a ranked team, uh, he will have the same record as Ty Willingham had when he was fired and let go to go get Urban Meyer. That didn't work out for him. But Charlie Weiss hasn't beaten anybody. Uh, his, his recruiting, he's talked about how great his recruiting is, but only the guys who are pro Notre Dame are ranking it high. I mean, it, it is a mess there, and I, I tell you what, there's a lot of people getting nervous up there about whether Charlie Weiss is going to be around next year. I think he's got to finish with at least a semblance of it's getting better. I like watching them play. They're, they're a fun team to watch, offensively very good, defensively not very good. I always like watching those teams. But uh, to lose the Navy two times at home in the last three years, that may be the death blow for Charlie Weiss. We'll see if it is, and we'll also see who our next uh, guest is here on the Pat Dooley Show, our special guest. He's coming up right after these messages. The Pat Dooley Show, brought to you by Windzone, locally owned and operated, featuring 15 award-winning flavors. Count on Windzone for all of your tailgating needs. Call or order online at windzone.com. Call for daily lunch specials. Ask about our 2 for 12 special. All right, welcome back to the Pat Dooley Show. I'm joined by my special guest today, Shane Matthews, who, of course, you're sitting in a chair that's been occupied by many celebrities. And then there's you. <laughs> that's right. What, uh, first of all, let's talk a little bit about what you're doing now. I know you're coaching at, at Gainesville High. Now, is that a volunteer basis? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. It's something I really enjoy doing, Pat, uh, working with the high school kids. It, I enjoy it more than I anticipated. Really? And, you know, we're 9-1, and one, won our district, getting ready for the uh, state playoffs, and I feel like we can make a, a, a long run at the state championship. They tell me the quarterback you've been tutoring over there is really something, Mr. McGriff. Yeah, uh, Ryan McGriff, who is the son of Mark McGriff, mm -hmm. former tight end for the Gators, uh, having a tremendous year. Our last game, he threw six touchdowns wow. and 450 yards for the district title. So he's had a great year. He's got a whole other year to play. Uh, I worked with him since he was a young kid, but uh, there's a lot of good players at Gainesville High. Well, obviously, uh, people also know Shane does radio in town. He's done some at uh, uh, 105 the game, but now at 1230 uh, a.m. down in Ocala and Gainesville. And, you know, you found yourself embroiled in a little controversy already this year. Did that whole thing catch you by surprise, just how it became a bigger deal than you could possibly imagine it? Well, yeah, you're referring to the, the comments that Urban made. It, it was blown way out of proportion right. by media guys. Not like by me. Yourself. Not by you, but your, <laughs> but your media buddies. But, uh, you know, I just said what was on my mind, and it got interpreted the wrong way. Right. And, um, you know, things are fine with me and Urban. Uh, I mean, what he's done here with our program, he's taken it to another level. Uh, we're by far probably the top football program in the country and uh, have a shot at another national title. When you uh, look at what's going on with Steve up in South Carolina, I'm sure you're surprised somewhat um, that they just can't seem to get over the hump. I was on a conference call with him this week, and he was bragging about being at six wins. That's when you know it's different for Steve up there. It really is. I mean, you know, being a former player, it's hard to see what he's going through there. and. You know, I don't care who the coach is at South Carolina or any of those mid-tier SEC schools. You're never going to have a, a year-in, year-out success. Right. Uh, it's hard for him to get the top-notch players there because sure. they're going to go to the Floridas, the Tennessees, the Georgia, Alabamas, the USC's. So, uh, you know, his span that he's been at South Carolina is the best they've ever had in the history of their program. But people thought that he would be able to, to bring a little bit more to the table. Yeah, I think they were talking about uh, being bowl, bowl eligible for the fourth straight or fifth straight time. They've never done that. Tells you a lot about South Carolina and why maybe they've had trouble succeeding is that they just have 
have really no history. Um, but you know, going let's go back to your days playing in Florida. Uh, just talk to me a little bit about what that was like to step on that field. I know we, we did the chapter for the book. When you finally were going to be the starter for that first game against Oklahoma State, you said, please run a screenplay or a draw play on that first play. Yeah, I mean, you know, to be named the starting quarterback for the golden child that had come back to take over the mm -hmm. program, you know, he goes out and names a guy who'd never taken a snap, never thrown a pass. I'm sure the boosters weren't real happy. and We didn't know who you were. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, you know, he comes into the locker room right before the Oklahoma State game, and he's like, Shane, what you want to start with? And, you know, being a – I was a little nervous, I'll be honest. Uh, you know, as a quarterback, you want to throw it. Right. But you want to get a completion, get the fans excited, kind of get into the, the flow of the game. I want to throw a screen. He's like, shoot, they didn't pay me all that money to come in here and run the ball. <laughs> so uh, we threw a deep crossing pattern to Ernie Mills for about 25 yards, and four plays later we scored Dexter McNabb and had a great career. That's a great – which is a great trivia answer. A lot of people don't get that one right. That's Who true. scored the first touchdown of the Spurrier era? It was yep. Dexter McNabb on a one-yard plunge. Took, took us five plays in the – First drive ever, so. That's right. And it, I was going to ask you this question on our either or segment, but I already came up with a new one. But if you had to throw a post pattern from the, to any of the guys from that era, who would be the guy? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, probably, uh, you know, the receivers that I played with, probably Ernie Mills. Uh, he had a play named after him, which yep, was actually a right. post. Uh, the Mills play. It's a square end with a post over the top. He caught several of those. But I would say Ernie, he was a, you know, he's an NFL player, struggled early in his career catching the ball. But when, yeah. when Dwayne Dixon and Spurrier and those guys got here, turned his career around. So uh, a lot of good, good guys came after that that I would have enjoyed throwing post routes to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Riddell, maybe. <laughs> Quasi. Ike, yeah. Ike. You're part of the media now, but you also are a former player. You've got a relationship with Urban now. When you hear all the criticism of this offense, I mean, you're watching this offense. You know, my take on it is, look, they don't have to score 40 points, so they're not. And if you try to score 40 and you don't really have the personnel, you might score 15 and get beat. Yeah, I mean, I'm an offensive guy, so I want to see explosive plays. Mm -hmm. It's just not there, and, and there's no problem with that. You know, I think Urban's, and you would know, but you were at the press conference when he was hired, is first thing he said, we're going to play great special teams, great defense, and we're going to run the football. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what they're doing, and they're winning games. They won 19 in a row, uh, school record. So, uh, you know, you don't have to score a whole lot with this defense. Right. You know, it's it's from what people tell me before. You know, Spurrier came along. Florida had great defenses every year, but Tremendous. but couldn't score, couldn't move the ball. Well, this offense can score when it needs to score, and and it, the the cool thing, even though I'm an offensive guy, is they can, they almost play keep away. Mm -hmm. They just move the chains, run the clock, keep that great defense well rested mm -hmm. and if they have to punt you got Chaz Henry really probably the best punter in the country you probably the second but Drew Butler from uh, yeah he's a good one really well, he has to punt a lot more than, than Chaz Henry does <laughs> but you know you punt them inside the 20 not many teams are going to drive 80 something yards on this defense exactly uh, last thing for you before we turn you loose for a bit and then we're going to bring Shane back for either or uh, you, you watched Tim Tebow play for four years you played in the NFL for many years I'm just curious what your thoughts are about his my take on it has always been I think he'll have a career in the NFL. I don't think he's going to be a pro bowler. I think he's going to be the kind of guy who's a journeyman, bangs around, maybe they put him in some wildcats and some different things. But he's too talented a football player not to play in the NFL. No, I agree exactly what you said. I don't think he's going to be an everyday starter, pro bowl guy. He'll probably bounce around like I did because he's a smart guy. He's a competitor. Uh, you know, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet against him because the guy's won at every level. Yeah. He's the, the most fierce competitor I've ever seen. You know, he came to our, our quarterback camp for three or four years. You could see then he had that, those intangibles. Um, and I think once he gets into a pro-style offense and can work at it every day since mm -hmm. it's year-round, no 20-hour rules, right. and work from, you know, dropping back from under center, learning how to read defenses and make throws on time, uh, I wouldn't bet against him. But, uh, you know, I, I like to tell people, I don't care what Tim Tebow does in the NFL. <laughs> it's all about what he does here wearing the orange and blue. And that's the biggest thing. I mean, he's the greatest player we've ever had. I wonder if, they'll, if there's an NFL rule against wearing uh, Bible verses on your eye block. There might be. That's interesting. You, remember, uh, McMahon couldn't wear the Adidas on his on his head. So that's true. And you know, uh, you don't want to get fined because those <laughs> fines are pretty expensive, like about ten grand for putting something on your eye black. So it, it'll be interesting to see. Well, he's going to be back and do either or with us. But right now, we got to go and see what's on today's list. 
Wing Zone was started in Gainesville and has over 70 locations across the country. Our Wing Zone has been recognized by the Wing Zone Corporation in 2007 as Franchise of the Year. Call 352-331-6011 or visit us online at wingzone.com. All right, it's time for the latest list, and later in the show we're going to do either or with Shane Matthews, and I'm going to ask him a little bit about the Heisman. Shane, of course, uh, was a Heisman contender uh, back in the, in the day, back in his day. I've never been a Heisman contender, but I do have a ballot, so be careful or I'll use it. Uh, my, here's my top five right now, and it's still wide open. Any of these five guys could win it, but I don't think it's going to come from somebody else. I really don't. Number five, C.J. Spiller, right up the street is where he played his ball, of course, and Florida thought they had him. Who knows how great they could have been. Oh, that's right. They won two national championships. But C.J. Spiller has done some amazing things, was getting into the mix anyway, and then he goes and lights up FSU for over 300 all-purpose yards. He's in there. It hurts him that, you know, it, Clemson needs to win that division uh, to get him to be a legitimate guy who's got a chance to win it. I think if they lose another game or, or down here, down the stretch, it's going to be hard to vote for a guy who's playing on a team that uh, you know, isn't, can't even win the division in the, in the ACC, even though it's not his fault. But as you know, it's a flawed system. Number four on my Heisman ballot right now would be Case Keenum from Houston. Look, he's put up better numbers than anybody. He's done some amazing things, some comeback wins. But I, I just look at the opposition. I, I'm sorry. I know you say, well, what are you talking about if you're a Houston fan? But I, I just, it, it's easier to do that. Prove it against a really good team, and then I'll buy it. Uh, number three, Tim Tebow. Yeah, he's... He's still in there, but he's definitely not at the top of my list right now. His numbers certainly would, would not warrant him being a candidate uh, in any other circumstances except the fact he's won it before, and he is Tim Tebow, and they are undefeated, and he's carrying this team on his back offensively. So he's in there. He, he's got a chance. We're going to talk about this later, but he's got a chance over the next three weeks, four weeks, or four weekends to – not only get, put his name up there high, but win this thing. It's not out of the realm of possibility. Number two, Colt McCoy from Texas, of course, similar situation to Tebow. Numbers are down, but he's led his team uh, to a, a national championship possibility, to led him to a Big 12 ch championship possibility, led him to an undefeated season so far this year. You look at him, and there's nothing that really excites you about him as a Heisman winner, except that he's been so successful, and, and his team's been successful. And when you're the quarterback, a senior quarterback who leads your team potentially in both Tebow and McCoy's case to a national championship, it carries a lot of weight. And number one, right now on my ballot, if I filled it out, we don't even have him yet, so I can't. Mark Ingram of Alabama, I think you got to look again. National championship contender, SEC West champs, undefeated. Big games, Ingram's come up big. The one blemish on his record was a fumble against Tennessee, but it's the only fumble he's had in 9,000 carries. So I'm not going to really hold that one against him. Uh, I think right now, if, if if the vote was taken, I would predict that Ingram would win. If the, when, the vote, when the vote is taken, and I predict Colt McCoy will win. But any of these five guys really has a chance. All right, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back with either or. Shane Matthews is going to rejoin me right after this. Check out the Pat Dooley Show, brought to you by Wing Zone. Remember, when it comes to your next football party, Wing Zone has you covered. Now offering convenient delivery. Call 352-377-2473 or go online to wingzone.com to order today. All right, welcome back to our latest segment of Either Or. Shane Matthews has rejoined me. We're going to ask him four questions, and he's going to try to give us intelligent answers. <laughs> Shane, number one. Which player will not make the trip to New York for the Heisman Trophy, Tim Tebow or C.J. Spiller? Oh, I'm going to have to say both will make it. I both think, will make I it. I think C.J. Spiller has made a late push, playing very well for the Clemson sure. Tigers. And I think Tim just kind of lingering there and is going to turn it on here at the end of the season, especially in the SEC Championship game. Well, he certainly has an opportunity to still win the Heisman but when you've got all these high-profile games and uh, big games. I mean, you're talking about an, what could be a national championship semifinal against Alabama, and if he lights them up and does some great things, he certainly can win it. You know, I think there's a misconception, Shane, that only three guys go. They can, they, they can bring as many as they want. Anybody who's in got enough votes, if it's fourth, it could be five. Yeah, that would be interesting. I was hoping, I guess, in 91 I came in fifth in the Heisman, but they only invited three guys. Three that year? So uh, You were a distant fifth, is that one? I guess. I guess. <laughs> I missed out. Well, that's not bad. You're one of uh, about – Five or six quarterbacks. How many quarterbacks have gotten Heisman votes in Florida? Well, you, Rexy, Rex, Rex should have won it. Should have won. Got robbed. Uh, Steve and Danny and Tim and you and Noah Brindice. Noah got his one vote from you, right? My one, his one vote from me. 
and he can always say that for the rest of his life. All right, uh, who do you think is going to win the Heisman, by the way? Ooh. If you had to say who's going to win it, not who's leading you right now, but I'm going to say C.J. Spiller. Wow, that would be something if a local kid. And you know, it's funny we were talking about. Think of how great Florida would have been with C.J. Spiller. Well, they won two national champs. Exactly. Of course, to win another one. But it still would have been fun. And, of course, I think Meyer thinks about that every time. Although, the SEC championship game not only could be to go to play for the national title, it could be to win the Heisman Trophy between Mark Ingram could. and Tim Tebow. Very easily. I got Ingram lead my, on my ballot right now. We'll see how that all works out. Uh, number two question on either or. One golf course to play for the rest of your life, Augusta National or Pebble Beach? I would have to say Augusta National. Never played it. Been there several times. Played Pebble Beach a couple of times. How have you? Uh, both wonderful golf courses, but since you can't just walk out and play Augusta National, yeah, that's true. I would say Augusta National. Yeah, I have played Augusta, but not Pebble Beach. I've walked that course uh, and love it. It's beautiful. I might lean towards Pebble Beach only because, it, you know, with the water there, there's a lot of different scenery where, it, as at Augusta, which is uh, one of the most beautiful pieces of property in the world, it's still, it's the same, you know, Nothing really changes there, but you can't go wrong with either one no. of those. And if they want to invite either one of us to do that, we'll be happy to play. Exactly. We won't play any other courses, we swear. Uh, number three, you're, the biggest win for you in 1991, of course, the year Florida won its first SEC, Florida State or Kentucky? Ooh, that, that's a good one. Uh, I'm going to have to say both, Pat. I can't pick one. I think just because uh, to have the first official title mm -hmm. after that Kentucky game, although we kind of let them back in the game yes. there. Pookie uh, Jones. It was a great celebration after that uh, with the fans and everything. Sure. And then the following week, uh, which was supposed to be a shootout between me and Casey Weldon turned into mm -hmm. a defensive battle and uh, winning that game 14-9. to nine. That, Those were two special weeks back to back. All right, the number four question on either or, Shane, which happens first? Florida loses to Vanderbilt in football or you start listening to my Weezer collection? Uh, it will be me listening to your Weezer collection. <laughs> Florida will never lose to Vanderbilt. Ever? Ever. Vanderbilt has no business being in our conference. No, I agree with you there. I yeah. mean, it, it really is pretty much a guaranteed win for Florida's and the Alabama's, those kind of teams. And uh, I just, it would be nice. I don't know who they would insert there or just take them out or what, but uh, they need to be in a, a, the ACC or, you know, go yeah. to wherever, you know, put them in Duke and Rice and... They should, that's what they need, they need like an academic conference. Yeah, absolutely. Northwestern, teams like that. That would be a great play. conference. Yeah, it would for, for College Bowl or whatever yeah. like that. But uh, I've said that a long... 98 was the year I, I kind of went, Vandy needs to get out. I went down, sat on the 50-yard line during the game. I mean, and early in the game. Uh, and of course, Florida was already way ahead. But yeah, it's just not a good fit. But um, hey, they're, they're going to... We're going to be stuck with them for a while, I'm afraid. All right, Shaner, thanks for coming in. All right, Pat. We're going to take a break, come back with Dr. Football's email bag. All right, let's see what we got this week. Thank you, young lady. All right, Dr. Football, I think that the argument that Florida's offense is inconsistent looks only at the scoreboard and not the actual offensive production. I think there is an argument that Florida has one of the most consistent offenses around, and I offer this remarkable stat as Exhibit A. Total offense, 375 against Vandy. 374 against Georgia, 376 against Mississippi State. Could we be any more consistent? This comes from John. John, thanks a lot for pointing that out for me, and you are right. And that's what I was talking about in my first segment. Florida is consistent. They're consistent at what they're trying to do and consistent at what they're going to do. They're not going to be a flashy team scoring a bunch of points this year. And I think if everybody just accepts that, embraces it, and just goes with it, win the game. That's all that matters. All right, I want to thank uh, Shane Matthews for coming in and being my special guest today. Thanks as always to Trish, who does a remarkable job all by herself back there, uh, taking video of me and making me look less hideous. That's gonna do it until next time. Until then, Pat Dooley saying so long from the Sunshine State.